The scene opens with a dragon being defeated by a girl and two boys, who make an opening for her to attack the dragon. She takes the chance, attacks the dragon with a sword strike, and sighs quickly. This was all in a game, as the next scene shows that the level has been cleared, and we see the gamer describe the game as one that allows for a full dive of all five senses and consciousness into a virtual world called the Virtual Reality Headgear. It's hard to eliminate your obsession once you get hooked on it. He introduces himself as Sora Kamajo, an addict to VR headgear. He complains about the other games he has recently played, claiming that they are worse than he had imagined. He reached for the new AAA game he recently got, and he is hoping this will be the game he has been looking for. A week prior, his younger sister Shiori Kamijo had found the mail addressed to them by Sukahai Management, noting that the package contained a game DL card for the latest full-dive virtual reality game, the first of its kind. He wondered why the company had sent him the package, as he had quit gaming three years prior. He went into his room with the package and played the game with his friends once, as he put on his VR headset. He started to pick his model for the game, while considering his friend's attributes. After he created his character, the game wished him the best of luck as Heaven's chosen adventurer. He was in the game almost simultaneously, but was confused as the beginning plaza was different. He thought this was a bug, but was surprised he had heard no reports. He started to move forward, trying to get lentils. He looked around his surroundings and figured he was in a castle. He decided to check out his job skills, but was stunned by the consumption, which was way too high. He wondered how well the game was built and how he could control his body effortlessly. He soon heard footsteps. He turned and found a silver-haired girl heading towards him. He was surprised about her energy as she felt like a natural person. He wondered if she was a princess or not. She welcomes him and is introduced as Shaitan, the demon king of the end. He recalls his sister's words about the game. His mission is to defeat Shaitan, who seeks to destroy the world. He was stunned, thinking about how he shouldn't confront the final boss yet as he just entered the game. She attacks him and he decides to attack back because he is a gamer and has to try his best to win, even when he knows it is a losing game. He was able to deflect her attack, causing her to be stunned about how he could. She contemplates and decides to channel fire magic to attack him. He notices her actions and runs towards a pillar to dodge the attack. She is astonished by his moves and decides to praise his moves a bit. He contemplates defeating her and confronting her with light attributes, even though his HP is already low. He attacks her and successfully pierces her heart while she praises him for surviving so long as a level 1 mage. She stabbed him into the pillar close by. As he waited for the game to tell him that he lost, the response never came. Shaitan responded to him, saying he was the first to step foot in her castle, and she was surprised as to how he was only level 1. He told her he was shocked, as he didn't expect his first mission to be in her castle. She offers to give him a gift, a gift that makes it impossible to return to reality. She kissed his forehead, and he felt a soft sensation as he drifted far away from her. He promises to come back and defeat her. From the battle, he gained some experience, and his level increased significantly. He was teleported to the city YG Gidrasil. He wanted to find his friends as quickly as possible, but he noticed the unusual stares from the people and just thought it was his aura since he was now at level 20. He finally found his friends in the garden and approached them, Shin, Shinji, and Ro, who is Shiro, and saw they were both level 18. He rushed to them, apologizing for keeping them waiting. They told him he had the wrong people, as they were waiting for their friend, not some cute girl. Hearing this, Sora was shocked. He checked his stats and saw his new character. The game informed him of the curse that reversed his gender and how it wouldn't change until Shaitan was defeated. The scene opens with Sora talking about how he had avoided games for three years and only returned when his friend recommended a VR game. He recounted how he battled with the Demon King, how she cursed him, and how it turned him into a girl. Surprised by the bizarre turn of events, Sora scratched his head and reluctantly accepted that the curse would linger until the dreaded Demon King met her match. As he pondered how to tell his friends about his predicament, he realized he wasn't quite ready to tell them publicly. I need to find a way to tell them, he muttered to himself, determined but cautious. With a plan forming in his mind, Sora's personality underwent a remarkable transformation. He radiates a newfound cuteness that leaves Shin and Ro utterly stunned. He almost pushes them away in surprise, urging them to join him for a chat in a secluded spot away from prying ears. But as they gather in this quiet corner, something unexpected happens. She took them to a corner and informed them he was Sora Kamio. She brought up their real lives to convince them. His friends weren't convinced, as the game doesn't allow for a change of gender. To convince them, he started telling them private stuff about them, their sister, and more. This finally convinced them, and they asked him why he was a beautiful, silver-haired girl. He explained the whole situation to them, and they agreed with him, but no one had reported experiencing that kind of bug in the game. One even suggested she recreate his account, but the game doesn't allow that. Sora isn't too pleased that he would have to stay as a girl until they defeat the Demon King. Sora decided to allocate his points gained from the battle against the Demon King. His stats had changed from a balanced type to a speed-oriented one with increased stamina, magic power, and many more. Seeing all the progress, Sora was happy, and his friends were surprised by his build. Sora told them he had initially wanted to quit, but after meeting the Demon King, he decided to play the game until he defeated her. His friends beamed joyfully as Sora
Sora announced his decision to stick around and conquer the game. Excitedly, they agreed to engage in some light battles to ease Sora back into the swing of things. But when they inquired about Sora's chosen job class, his response caught them completely off guard. I'm a support mage, Sora revealed with a grin. But thanks to the curse from the Demon King, my magic consumption is reduced to a tenth of its normal level. Shinji and Ro's jaws practically hit the floor as they processed this bombshell. Their screams echoed through the room, a mix of shock and disbelief at the unexpected twist in Sora's gaming journey. They headed to the battlefield, and Sora tried out his body and status. Sora displayed an expert's abilities, which caught the attention of others as Sora was in beginner's wear. Shinji and Ro complimented his moves, and he explained that his new body makes him more flexible and makes it easier for him to carry out those moves effortlessly, unlike before. Ro and Shinji laughed at how Sora had always been very different from them. As they were having their little friend banter, Sora received an inbox containing a party invite and gifts. They were from Ro and Shinji, who were planning to sell the gifts prior, but now, they hoped the gifts would be great for Sora. Equipping those gifts boosted his abilities. Sora started to attack the slimes on the battlefield to gain experience. His friends looked by and reaffirmed how Sora was different, as he could control two powers simultaneously, something they hadn't witnessed from a support mage ever. Sora asked his friends to keep hunting, and they joined him excitedly. Sora's level went up from 20 to 21, which surprised his friends how fast that happened. Sora was surprised and asked if they hadn't leveled up. They broke it down to him that killing slimes lower than their level would not make them level up. They had to kill slimes that were at least level 30 to level up. Sora's friends offered their theories, speculating that his lightning-fast leveling up might be attributed to a special skill or title he'd acquired. Intrigued, Sora quickly dove into his character's stats, eager to uncover the source of his newfound prowess. And there it was, staring back at him from the screen. The title, Adventurer Who Had Seen the Demon King of the End. Its effects were even more surprising than he'd imagined, a significant boost in experience point gain until the Demon King met her demise. But the secondary effect truly blew his mind. It also extended to his party members, ensuring that everyone benefited from the accelerated leveling. Sora couldn't help but grin from ear to ear as he shared this revelation with his friends. Together, they marveled at the unexpected perk of their encounter with the Demon King, realizing that their journey was about to get much more exciting and rewarding. Sora then asked if Ro and Shinji belonged to a clan, to which they responded by saying no and that they were independent. Ro explained that joining a party was difficult, and that's why they were independent, as they only wanted to enjoy the game and not be tied down by the rules of a party or clan. Just as they were discussing, a girl ran towards them, asking for help as a dragon chased after her. Shinji confirms that the dragon is the area boss, the slime dragon. Sora uses insight to check up on information about the dragon. Sora realizes the slime dragon is just at level 20 and cannot fly yet. She wonders why none of the other teams can help the screaming girl. As she poised herself to strike at the slime dragon, Sora's hand gripped her sword tightly, determination blazing in her eyes. But before she could make her move, Ro and Shinji intervened, extending their hands in a gesture of solidarity. We're in this together, they declared, their voices brimming with newfound resolve. Sora was excited by their response and chanted for them to defeat the slime dragon. The girl running was questioning how unlucky she was and how she had to be the one who encountered the slime dragon. While running, she started chanting the names of different gods, hoping that one would be willing to save or help her. She also called for the adventurers, but none came to her rescue. She stumbled as she ran, falling face first to the ground. Just as the slime dragon was about to reach her, Sora attacked the dragon, deviating the dragon's attention from the girl on the floor to herself. Sora was able to dodge the dragon's attack. Shinji saw this and praised Sora for her skills. Shinji announced it was his turn as she began to attack the dragon with thunder spells, a weakness Sora had announced when she used insight on the dragon. Sora raised her hands to the helpless girl and asked her to run to rescue now. Ro entered the battle as he reinforced his shield to fight against the dragon's attack. Sora came in with her speed and used the momentum to attack the dragon using three consecutive hits, and the legs of the dragon separated from the body, causing the dragon to wail in pain as it fell. Shinji was stunned, and so was Ro, who announced that he finally understood why the support images consumed a considerable amount of MP because their attacks were so powerful. Now, Sora found a way around that. The dragon started flying as it shot long-range attacks at Sora. Ro and Shinji wouldn't just stand by and watch Sora get killed, so Shinji attacked the dragon with a thunderball attack. Three balls of lightning directed at the flying dragon, which was a critical hit. Ro sprang into action as he observed the situation unfold. With a swift motion, he fortified his shield, readying himself for the impending clash. With a grin of determination, he unleashed a powerful skill known as Bash, utilizing the reinforced shield to deliver a devastating blow to the dragon. The impact echoed through the battlefield as Ro's attack struck the slime dragon, causing the dragon to stagger under the force. 
With their synchronized teamwork, each strike landed precisely, chipping away at the dragon's formidable health bar. The dragon got agitated and charged up for a massive attack. Seeing this, the team got scared as they felt the aura of the incoming attack. Ro asked them to get behind his shield, as it had gotten more substantial due to the buffs that Sora gave him. They asked if he was sure, to which he responded, saying he was even though it usually needed three knights. He believed he alone, with the help of Sora's buffs, could handle the attack with the help of his spirit. Sora found this refreshingly outrageous, and they all got behind Ro's shield. Ro got in position and used the skill Phalanx, which grants a 50% damage cut to up to three people in a party at once. The attack came, and Ro endured it, shielding Sora and Shinji. Shinji informed Sora that after the attack, the dragon would be unable to move for 30 seconds, so they had to act fast. Sora said 30 seconds was more than enough. She channeled all her energy to boost Shinji's attack. Shinji was excited as the dragon only had 50% HP left, and with the support from his party members, his next attack would quickly clear the dragon. He got in position and chanted Thunderball, which attacked the dragon, but wasn't enough to clear it. So he used another skill, Rush Skill, Sonic Lance. But all this only shaved off 20% of the dragon's HP. Sora saw this as the perfect opportunity to attack the dragon attacking the dragon with both her sword and spells, Triple Stream and Enchant Sprung, which allowed her to attack three consecutive times and also helped her leap further. She canceled the third hit and switched techniques, laying the final blow on the dragon, causing maximum damage. The game announced that they had cleared the level and defeated the slime dragon. Sora plummeted down from the sky because she had exhausted herself, but her level and proficiency had risen. Just as she closed her eyes expecting a considerable fall, she landed on someone else. It turned out to be the girl who had been chased by the dragon prior. She informed Sora that she couldn't let Sora crash, so she used her body to save Sora. Sora was grateful, but told her she didn't have to do all that. The running girl said she had too as she fell in love with Sora the first time she saw Sora talking about how it was much better to be rescued by a beautiful lady than a handsome man. This caused Ro and Shinji to laugh, and Sora was too stunned to speak. Running Girl finally introduced herself as Rini, a ninja. Her job was as a freelance virtual reality journalist. She asked permission to post about what happened today on her blog. Sora introduced herself to Rini, but had reservations, as most journalists just posted for clicks and money. Rani assured Sora that she wasn't like that. She showed Sora the video footage she took and Sora even complimented it. She informed Sora that she had learned VR photography from Shigur and was confident in her abilities. This information stunned Sora, and he politely asked about the relationship between Rini and Shigur. She told Sora that she had met Shigur in college and had their contact information. Rini asked for Sora's permission again by calling her Sora-sama, which Sora didn't like, but Rini informed him that she couldn't call her anything else except that. She saw that Sora was hesitant and promised to admit that Sora was a support mage, which would have caused so much commotion. Sora and his team agreed. Rani thanked them and asked to add Sora as a friend so she could send her a reward later, but nothing or rare affinity as she didn't have anything of that sort. She bid them farewell and left. They noticed her speed and wondered how she wouldn't have escaped from the dragon earlier if she had had that fast speed. The scene opens with them in an inn after they have completed the mission. We see Sora in the room as she clicks out of the game. Sora returns to his room and confirms that the game was as fun as they had stated. He heard a knock on his door and his sister called to ask if he had logged out of the game and how she had made some pasta for lunch. He responded, saying that he was coming. His voice voice stunned him, and his sister thought he had invited a girl home. Sora noticed his voice had gotten so high, his clothes got more prominent, and he noticed his long hair. He suddenly realized that the build in his game was the same build he had in reality. After noticing the changes in his body, he fell to the floor. Hearing the loud noise, his sister rushed into the room, asking what was wrong. She saw Sora in his female form, and started to scream about how a perverted girl was in her brother's room. Sora hurriedly tried to calm her down, telling her that he was her brother and was just trapped in his body. Shiori didn't believe what she heard, and and Sora thought of how to convince her of his identity. He then started to tell her about the recent game he was playing. After explaining for so long, Shiori felt like the strange girl in front of her felt like her brother. Shiori fainted after contemplating and accepting the reality in front of her for a while. Soon after she woke up, they went to eat the food Shiori had made, and Shiori inquired if Sora was okay. Sora reached out to Shiori with a half-hearted smile, admitting, I'm not really okay, but this pasta is amazing. Shiori couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness, despite the compliment. Seeing Sora like this, clearly struggling, dampened her spirits. Meanwhile, Sora continued devouring the pasta, puzzled by his insatiable hunger, even after transforming into a lady. Why am I still hungry? He mused between mouthfuls, his confusion evident. But despite the mystery of his perpetual hunger, the delicious pasta provided a momentary distraction from his troubles. Sora also inquired about his sister, asking if she was okay as she had fainted earlier. She said she was okay and was just surprised by all the information, which caused her to faint. She asked Sora if he knew the cause for the reversal, to which he responded, 
responded honestly. He informed her of how he got into the game and found himself in the Demon King's castle, and how they had fought, causing him to hurt her, and then she stabbed him also. He informed his sister how she had cursed him and caused his gender to swap and how he had leveled up. He would have to defeat the Demon King to change back to his original form. He wasn't sure about how the game world and the natural world are linked. Shiori was surprised at how stories in anime and manga happen. Sora was downcasted about how he would have to live now as a lady until the Demon King was defeated. Fortunately, he was on summer break. Shiori suggested that he take a hospital trip to get checked up. He agreed to go to the hospital. She quickly urged him not to bother as it wasn't affecting his health. Shiori was worried that something might happen to her and she would be left alone to bear the cross. Sora reluctantly agreed to go with her the following Friday. He said he would love to mentally prepare himself for the day. His acceptance made her happy and she told him she would inform the hospital about it while withholding information. Hearing about Florine, he asked if that group of girls loved playing games. She confirmed that she was indeed the girl she was talking about. She asked if he remembered taking her to one of their offline events. Sora thought about how he wasn't even sure how he would explain the situation to a hospital. The worst case was that they would send him to a psychiatrist. However, the most important thing right now was how he would explain the situation to his parents. He thought it would be a massive problem if his parents found out. However, they are currently overseas doing important business work. Sora begged Shiori to let them tell their parents about it when they got home from work overseas. Shiori agreed they would drop their work and come home immediately if they found out, so they wouldn't tell them about it now but later. Sora spoke up, finally asking Shiori to stop touching his legs, which were ticklish. Shiori stood up suddenly, causing Sora to feel bad about her subsequent actions. Just as he was watching her with detective's eyes, she reached out and touched his chest area, feeling his boobs. Sora jumped up and ran across the room. Shiori was pleased about her discovery, as she confirmed that he was sensitive in his new body and that the boobs were natural. She laughed, informing Sora that he looked like a scared kitty with the way he was fidgeting, and with that, they began a game of cat and mouse as Shiori chased Sora around the house. After playing for so long, they sat on the couch with Sora exhausted and Shiori happy about her fun playing with Sora. She told Sora that she didn't expect the new silver-haired player to turn out to be her brother. Sora leaned in with a curious glint in her eye and asked, Hey, did you catch a glimpse of me in the game earlier? But instead of a nod or a yes, his sister shook her head. She whipped out her phone with a mischievous grin and showed Sora something unexpected, a blog post about the mysterious white-haired player. Sora's eyes widened as she scanned through the post, which detailed her recent epic battle against the slime dragon. Whoa, wait a minute, Sora exclaimed. His sister's excitement tinged with disbelief. Someone actually filmed that and posted it online? But that's totally against the rules. But despite the rule breaking, Sora couldn't help but feel a surge of pride at the thought of her heroic deeds being shared with the world. It was like stepping into the spotlight of her virtual adventure, even if it meant bending the rules a little. Sora was surprised by how viral the post had already become and asked why. Shiori informed him that he was so out of touch with games that the game doesn't allow players to set their hair to white or silver. He was the first person in the virtual reality game to have silver hair. Shiori informed him that the conversation was about his silver hair, which resulted from a unique quest he had cleared, and that the hair color was the reward. Shiori informed him that some quests are designated as special quests, and once completed, they disappear from the game. She informs him that everyone in the game is already discussing how to recruit him for their party, even the leaders of her clan. Sora was lost, and asked what recruitment she was talking about. She informed him that it wasn't just about his looks. Still, he displayed a more significant skill level than they had ever experienced in the beginner arena, so everyone was trying to recruit him. Sora wondered about what they saw after seeing his skills. She informed him of how everyone was guessing his skill stats already. Already, informing him I had already guessed that he was a support mage, and they knew of his three-shot attack skill, which no other top player had in the game. She showed him the comment section of the blog post. Sora was downcast, as he had gotten too excited and shown his skills, leading to his recent popularity. He was so glad they hadn't discovered his other skills like Lucifer, or the six superior skills. If they had found out about the skills, it would have caused a more considerable commotion. Sora asked Shiori why she wasn't trying to recruit him to her clan, as she was the vice captain of her clan. She told him not to worry, as she knew how sensitive he gets around other people, so she was okay with him just playing with his friends. Sora was glad that he had an understanding sister. He checked the time and figured it was time to return to the game, as he had promised to meet Shinji and Ro again. In Sora's cozy room, he sat pondering, wondering what twists awaited him in the virtual realm, but determination sparked within him like a flame igniting. I'll get stronger, he declared to himself, his resolve as solid
Kamala to steal. I'll defeat Shaitan and reclaim my life. That'll fix everything. With renewed determination coursing through his veins, he powered up his console and logged into the game. As he settled into his gaming chair, he felt a surge of energy, as if his essence was infused with the spirit of a true gamer. Failure wasn't an option for Sora. His gamer spirit never backed down from a challenge, no matter how daunting. It was time to show Shaitan who was boss and take back what was rightfully his. Sora was back in the Yggdrasil kingdom, in the same room he had logged out. He was glad he had returned to the game safely. He figured there was still time left before he met with Ro and Shinji, so he checked his current status. He was surprised at how he went from level 21 to level 22. He also looked at this unique skill, Lucifer, which he had always wondered about. The description of the skill informs him that if he consumes one destiny, he can transform into Kusai. He wanted to try out the skill, but pushed it back as he had a limited amount of destiny and didn't want to waste it in a room. As far as Sora understood, the skill could quadruple the number of job points he earned. He realized that he was earning four times more than he usually should, so he had to choose carefully the skills he wanted to enhance. He decided to enhance his strength, speed, and protection. His MP consumption increased from 30 to 60, but considering what he could do, this was still great. He saw an unopened reward from his last quest. In the box, Sora found Archive, a coat that a knight wore that the slime dragon had killed. The coat had just stagnated in the slime dragon's belly, waiting for a suitable owner. Sora saw this and smiled as he tried on the coat. He was so pleased with the outcome and was carried away by joy until he realized he was late for a meeting with his friends. Sora went to the meeting spot, but didn't find Shinji or Ro, even though they had logged in. Sora was admiring the coat while he waited for his friends until he realized that it wasn't just amazing, it was also cute with the horns. He fell to the ground, sad about the fact that he was getting used to his female form. Sora waited half an hour and saw no sign of Shinji or Ro. Sora was worried as Ro was always an hour early for their usual meetings, and now he wasn't even here. Just as Sora was thinking about how something could have happened to them, he heard a loud noise and saw a huge crowd gathering. He decided to check it out and found Shinji and Ro all beaten up there. Sora thought to himself how attacks and monsters were nullified in the city, and the only way to get injured was via a duel, which means that Shinji and Ro had participated in one, causing them to be injured. Some approached Sora, stating that Sora had finally decided to show up. Glenn confirmed that he was the one who attacked Shinji and Ro. Even though that wasn't his intention, as a competitive gamer, he couldn't turn down a duel. Sora turned to Shinji and Ro, asking why they had challenged Glenn to a duel. They responded, saying they agreed because if they won, Glenn and his crew would leave Sora alone, but they hadn't thought that they would get beat up instead. Glenn acknowledged Shinji and Ro's prowess, but he claimed that as a pro, he wasn't going to get beat up by amateurs who only fought with mobs. Sora announced that she would take her revenge as Shinji and Ro fought for her sake and lost. Glenn heard the remark and fidgeted a bit as he thought Sora was just as strong as their leader, if not stronger. Guard, the other person who fought against Ro and Shinji, was, however, feeling pompous and thought that with the combined strength of both him and Glenn, there was no way they wouldn't defeat Sora as she was just an amateur. Guard continued to berate Sora, stating how Shinji and Ro couldn't even deal 20% damage to them. He talked about how Sora wouldn't be able to do much either. Sora heard this and smirked, asking, is that so? Sora confidently nodded to Guard's challenge and summoned the dueling circle, a mystical arena where their battle would unfold. As the shimmering field materialized around them, Sora wasted no time, springing into action with a flurry of skillful movements. Her sword moved through the air as she launched a relentless assault on Guard. With a playful smirk, she taunted him. Let's see if you can last just 10 seconds. If you do, I'll give you some well-deserved praise. Guard braced himself for the onslaught, determined to prove himself against Sora's formidable skills. Sora defeated Guard in one move. She faced Glenn and asked if he wanted to duel with her also. She sent him a request to duel, and just as he was about to accept the fuel, a hand grabbed Glenn, causing Glenn to be surprised. Sora assumed a defensive stance. The newcomer asked Glenn why he was attacking a beginner who wasn't even well-equipped. The newcomer revealed Glenn's identity as the vice president of Hellhev. He looked at Sora and carefully examined her outfit, confirming that he understood what the newcomer said. Glenn apologized, saying, I am sorry. I got swept up by the moment there. I guess I am still immature. He called to his clan members and asked them to withdraw. He looked back at Sora and told her they would have the opportunity to play some other time. Sora didn't like this and was about to give chase when the newcomer stopped her. The newcomer tapped her head and told her that she was strong, but had she fought against Glenn, she would have lost. As Sora was about to respond, the newcomer said, look at your partner. You're losing your cool. Sora looked at his sword and realized that it only had 10% durability after he had used it. The newcomer leaned in, sharing vital information with Sora. You see, it wasn't Guard himself who posed the biggest threat, they explained earnestly. It was his armor. Your sword took quite a beating in that one head-on clash with it. Sora's eyes widened in realization as she absorbed the news. Guard's armor had proven to be far sturdier than he had anticipated, causing significant damage to Sora's 
sword in their confrontation. The newcomer reached out a helping hand and introduced himself as Kairi. He was a blacksmith and the vice leader of the Tenmoku Ichika clan, one of the three prominent clans in the game. He told Sora that this wasn't a great place to talk and invited her over with her friends to his store so they could have the needed privacy. Sora agreed to this and followed Kairi to his store. After a short walk, they finally arrived at Kiri's store. He introduced his store, Little Breed, to them. Sora and his friends were stunned by the number of first-class items available in the store. Shinji and Ro noticed some items that were posted on the news site once and were surprised. Sora claimed all the items in the store were too expensive for her to get. Kiri laughed and told them he had gotten it as a reward for clearing a limited quest involving a blacksmith ghost. This information shocked Shinji and Ro, who discussed how even the cheapest houses and stores in the game cost at least a billion dollars, and how, even if they had their workshop, they couldn't achieve all this within a month. Hearing the value, Sora was stunned. Kiri called out to them, asking if they enjoyed it so much in there. With that, he asked Sora if he could take a look at her sword, which Sora gave him willingly. Kiri started to scrutinize the sword. Sora started to wonder to herself, is the sword condition that bad? Because Kiri stared at it for a very long time. Kiri finally lifted her gaze from the sword, her eyes widening in awe as she took in its details up close. I've been admiring this sword from afar for quite some time, she confessed. But seeing it in person now, it's truly magnificent. Turning her attention to Sora, Kiri couldn't help but express her shock. How on earth did you manage to mistreat such a remarkable sword? She questioned, her curiosity piqued by the apparent wear and tear evident on the blade. She told him that she didn't know either. He told her that she was lucky because the durability of a beginner's sword was the best. The game made it so beginners could manage their swords longer until they could afford new ones. Sora looked so sad because she had used up the durability of her sword before she had enough to even buy a new one. Kiri asked her not to be sad, as she was mainly praising Sora. Kiri asked, what did you fight with this sword? As she knew that guard's armor alone wouldn't have caused this much damage to the sword, Sora thought of what could have caused the sword's durability to dwindle that much. But she could only think of the Demon King's attacks as one of the factors. She couldn't reveal this to Kiri, as Kiri was just a stranger. Ro came to Sora's rescue, claiming they had fought a brutal monster as part of a limited quest. Sora agreed, claiming that the sword probably took all the damage then. Kiri found this hard to believe, as she said it certainly looked like Sora had parried a heavy clash. She wondered if it was a rare human-type monster paired with a sword. Sora was surprised that Leary was able to deduce that much from just looking at the sword. Kiri lets the conversation die down, claiming that what Sora fought wasn't the issue at the time. Kiri asked Sora, how about turning your sword into an ingot? Sora didn't understand, so Kiri had to break it down for them. And he turned, asking who the newcomer was. Kiri informed them that just as he had gotten to level 20 this morning, he found out that weapons also receive experiences as the fighter uses them. When the weapon has accumulated enough, it can be melted into metal and used to create a new, high-quality weapon. This discovery shocked the entire squad as they questioned, weapons can make rare ingots? Kiri responded by saying that only weapons with enough experience were needed. Otherwise, the ingot would be of the same quality. Sora asked, Does that mean my sword meets the requirements? Kiri told her that it does. Kiri was shocked to see that much experience on the Airstream series, as the beginner swords were the hardest to get experience on. Kiri offered to help Sora make a new sword. Even though Sora was excited about this offer, he couldn't help but ask, How much would that cost me? With a gloomy look, Kiri informs Sora that, for now, he doesn't charge to turn weapons into ingots. The price is only determined by the rarity of the ingot. Kiri explains how an F-rank weapon would cost around 10,000 euros. Kiri states that even though his swords were more expensive than those of the NPC stores, the quality and durability of his swords were far superior. Kiri claimed that he would even be willing to make the ingot first for people he trusted and then have them pay later. Kiri claimed that Sora didn't look like the type to run away while owing money, so she could pay later after he had made the sword. Sora was really pleased with this gesture. Kiri informed her that she was willing to do it all for free as a token of their friend. Friendship. Sora was stunned and asked if that was okay. Kairi reassured her that it was, and even offered that Shinji and Ro could pick out what they wanted from her prototypes. They were so happy with this offer, as they got to pick whatever they wanted from the famous Little Breed. Kiri flashed a warm smile before excusing herself to the back room. But before disappearing, she paused, reaching out to hand Sora a gleaming sword. Could you watch over my store for a bit? She requested earnestly. I need to work on your sword, and please, pass it on to the owner when they come to collect it. Sora accepted the responsibility with a nod feeling honored to be entrusted with such a task. As he examined the sword, his eyes widened in astonishment when he caught sight of the price tag dangling from its hilt. His jaw practically hit the floor in disbelief at the sword's considerable value, leaving him momentarily speechless at the unexpected revelation. Shin and Ro cleaned up the store to thank Kairi for her generous act while Sora watched over the store even though the checkout was automatic. However, Sora still found it hard to smile all day. A customer soon ran out saying, I'll be back later, after witnessing Sora in the store fake smiling. Sora asked, 
asked Shin and Ro what weapons they pick, and they happily showed off. Shin got a D-rank Iron Magic Lance, and Ro got a D-rank Iron Heater Shield. Sora was excited to see his new weapon, and claimed he would love to go to the frontline map after it was done. At this moment, the bell at the entrance rang, and a girl dressed in black came in. She greeted Sora and introduced herself as Kuro. Kuro asked Sora, Are you the Silver Support Mage, Sora? Sora was hesitant, and decided to use Insight to evaluate Kuro. He saw she was from the same clan that had attacked him and his friends earlier, and was at level 20. He noticed her cold stare, as if she wanted to swallow him. Unfortunately, Sora is only scared of his mentor, his parents, and his little sister when she gets angry. Kuro moved closer to him, saying, I heard you were a boy, but you are a girl no matter how I look at you. This innocent look, paired with such a heavy statement, scared Sora. He wondered how she knew he was a boy, as the only people who knew that were few. Who do you think Kuro is, and how did she know Sora is a boy? We are excited to see how the story goes, but we must take a break and not bore you. Check back for more as we continue with other chapters on our channel. Thank you. Kuro, a girl clad in a black dress, was addressing Sora, who stood before her. She mentioned hearing rumors about Sora's identity, but regardless of her scrutiny, she could only see Sora as a girl. Shocked, Sora asked Kuro, with an anxious expression, how she knew he was actually a man. Kuro, maintaining her composure, informed Sora that Shigur, her cousin and most esteemed disciple, had revealed this to her. Sora, unable to believe her ears, sought confirmation that Kuro was indeed referring to the renowned pro-gamer, Shigure. To validate her claim, Kuro opened her status screen, showing Sora their mutual connection with Shigur. Despite this revelation, Sora remained skeptical in her mind, concluding that a shared friendship with Shigur was not sufficient grounds for trust. Sora voiced her concerns, suggesting that there could be numerous reasons for their mutual acquaintance. At that moment, Kuro began to feel an inexplicable sensation, causing her to wonder about its origin. Shaking off the feeling, Kuro explained that she had come to retrieve something from maintenance, inquiring if Kiri had given Sora a black sword. Sora, retrieving the sword, questioned if it was the item Kuro sought. Upon receiving the sword from Sora, Kuro expressed her gratitude, and as she was about to unsheathe it from her hip, she preemptively apologized for what was to come. This took Sora by surprise, and before she could react, Kuro struck at her. Sora narrowly evaded the attack by reflex, a skill honed from gaming experiences filled with lethal threats. Regaining her composure, Sora, now confused and perspiring, demanded to know why Kuro had attacked her, noting that outside of duels, such actions were harmless, but could still result in penalties. Kuro praised Sora's reflexes, remarking that it was just as Shigure had described. Sora, feeling a sense of unease due to the familiar style of Kuro's swordsmanship, which mirrored her mentors, questioned Kuro's relationship with Shigure. Kuro disclosed that she was Shigure's disciple and had been tasked with locating Sora while retrieving her sword, hoping to spar with a fellow disciple. Sora responded with indifference, puzzled by how Shigure could recognize him despite his altered appearance. Kuro assured Sora that Shigure was confident in identifying him through his distinctive combat style. Sora responded, acknowledging that she now understood, noting the similarity to her master's tone. She mused that being a fellow disciple could pose a problem, then firmly told Kuro never to repeat such actions. Kuro retorted, having heard that it was permissible among disciples. Sora countered, pointing out the presence of others, suggesting such things should only happen when they were truly alone. Kuro conceded, promising to be more cautious in the future. Internally, Sora decided she would need to voice her concerns about Kuro to Shigure. Observing Kuro's peculiar expression, Shigure inquired about her well-being, sensing Kuro's eagerness to speak. Kuro acknowledged Sora as Shigure's top student and challenged her to a duel, catching Sora off guard. Despite her surprise, Kuro persisted, boasting of her victories over formidable opponents and her desire to spar with Shigure herself. As Sora listened, she revised her initial impression of Kuro from a sincere and adorable girl to a combat fanatic. Sora expressed her willingness to accept the challenge, but cited the lack of a weapon and her duty to mine the store until Kiri's return. She suggested Kuro duel the two men in the store instead. Kuro approached the men with a charming smile, proposing a duel. One man, embracing his role, agreed, while the other, recognizing Kuro as Shigur's disciple, vowed to give his best. The battle commenced, and Sora, observing Kuro's technique, saw her mentor's influence. The duel was swift, with Kuro emerging victorious. The men, acknowledging their defeat, left to train further. Kuro, noticing Sora's weary expression, questioned if she had erred. 
Sora reassured her, just as Kiri entered, thanking Sora and inquiring about the day's events. Sora, sweating, explained Kuro's attachment due to their shared discipleship, despite their brief acquaintance. As Kuro clung to her, the men excused themselves for outdoor training, apologizing for the ongoing cleanup. Kiri dismissed the concern, and Kuro, still embracing Sora, commented on the familiar scent she shared with Shigur, which she found comforting. Kiri responded to Kuro, affirming that there is indeed a resemblance between Sora and Shigur, not in appearance, but in their aura. He then turned to Sora, proudly announcing the completion of her sword, which he considered one of his finest creations. Sora's joy was palpable upon seeing her sword, thankful that it remained intact. She examined the sword's status, noting its Type-C rarity, prompting Kiri to urge her to unsheathe it, promising a delightful surprise. As Sora drew the sword, both she and Kuro were struck by its exquisite beauty, filling Sora with excitement. She proclaimed that with this sword, her chances against the Demon King were significantly improved. This led Kiri and Kuro to question her reference to the Demon King, to which she explained that he is the ultimate adversary in their game. With Kairi's return, Sora suggested they step outside for the eagerly anticipated duel with Kuro. Kuro agreed enthusiastically, stipulating that victory would grant her a single request. Sora accepted the challenge, asserting that she too would make a request upon winning, and advised Kuro to be well prepared. Kuro, observing Sora's stature, speculated that Sora must be older than her. Sora, taken aback, clarified that she is merely a high school student. Kuro expressed skepticism, implying that Sora might be deceiving her about her age, but Sora insisted that she was telling the truth. A large crowd of players had assembled, and Kuro was the reason for this gathering. Kuro had a reputation for challenging formidable players to player versus player PvP duels. When the other players saw her confronting another strong player, they congregated to wager on the outcome. Sora, upon opening her status screen, noticed numerous comments. It seemed to her that people were getting quite excited about the duel. Two of the users on her screen were discussing a sonic sword in a fight against Guard, saying that the movements reminded them of watching the God of War's fight in Sukahai five years ago. Another user inquired about the identity of the person the other users were discussing. The user responded by saying that the person was one of the only six players who had reached the final boss in Sky High Fantasy, another VRMORPG that used to be popular some time ago. As Sora read these comments, her attention was completely captured. Kuro, who was standing beside her, asked Sora what was wrong. Sora closed her status screen, turned to Kuro with a big smile, and said nothing was wrong. She suggested they should start the duel, and Kuro agreed. Kuro asked Sora if she was sure about using her lower-level equipment in a duel against her, because Sora's equipment was starter's gear. Sora replied nonchalantly that she had her cost, and that they should just proceed with the duel. This surprised Kuro, causing her to let out a shocked sound. She asked Sora if she was underestimating her by using low-level equipment. Sora reassured her that she was not underestimating her, and that Kuro was one of the strongest people she had met. Kuro responded by saying that in that case, she would give Sora some time to get her equipment in order and that she didn't mind sharing some of her ER with Sora. Sora replied with a big smile, saying that the offer was very kind of Kuro. But with a serious look on her face, she said that she was not the type to accept such offers. Kuro, stretching out her sword, told Sora that she shouldn't end up blaming her equipment for her loss when it happens. Then Sora charged at her with an attack-increasing skill, activating high strength, and Kuro blocked it easily. Kuro analyzed the attack, saying that they both used the same technique, but the power was different. Sora asked her what Kuro was talking about. Kuro replied with a straight face, telling Sora not to play dumb with her, and that the red light she just saw was a support skill. She said she knew there was something special about Sora. Kuro swung into action to attack Sora. Sora analyzed her movement, saying that Kuro was fast, using a skill that allows fast movement in two different directions at the same time, known as Sonic Move, which can be pulled off by only a handful number of players. Also, Kuro's ability to connect a hit from that is something even fewer can do. However, even if Kuro may be fast, her movement is easy to read. Kuro swiftly executed two horizontal strikes against Sora, who managed to block them with ease. As she defended herself, Sora complimented Kuro's technique, noting that it seemed well-practiced. Kuro retorted, pointing out that Sora had been mostly on the defensive. Feeling the weight of her sword, Sora told Kuro she would demonstrate her own skills. She then activated a speed-increasing skill, followed by a rush skill, which triggered her sonic sword. 
However, Kudo countered with two horizontal strikes, using her dual nail skill. Sora blocked the first strike and cancelled the second, surprising Kuro. Sora then switched her skill, activating Strike Sword and landing a hit on Kuro, knocking her down. Despite the setback, Kuro got up, questioning how Sora had managed to dodge her earlier attack, given the minimal time gap between the dual nail strikes. Sora responded with a faint smile, saying it was simple and referencing a game she had played called Sword Dance, where dodging such attacks was a basic requirement. She then challenged Kuro, asking her to demonstrate how she had defeated other strong players. Kuro, with a determined look, agreed to show Sora. She charged at Sora with increased speed. Sora noticed the speed increase and anticipated an attack from the right, but Kuro surprised her by changing direction and attacking from behind. Knowing she wouldn't have time to turn and counter, Sora closed her eyes, activated her sense skill, and positioned her sword behind her to block Kuro's attack without looking. Their swords clashed, and Sora, satisfied that her sense skill had detected Kuro's attack, prepared for the next move. Kuro, however, wasn't done. She charged at Sora again, using a martial artist's starting skill, Dragon Kick, and landed a hit on Sora's face. Despite the pain, Sora endured, her health points dropping by almost half. The strike that hit Sora infuriated her, causing her to become more serious and deliver a decisive blow to Kuro's abdomen. This resulted in Kuro losing all her strength, causing her to stagger and nearly fall. However, Sora supported her before she could hit the ground, advising her to take it easy. Sora complimented Kuro on her fighting prowess, admitting that she wouldn't have won without her superior skills. As a result of Kuro's defeat in the duel, the game imposed a penalty of physical weakness on Kuro for about three hours. Sora supported Kuro, acting as her leg. As Kuro leaned on Sora's shoulder, she expressed her surprise that skills could be used without a weapon. Sora responded by pointing out that there was no rule stating that a weapon was needed to use a skill. She had simply tried it, and as Kuro could see, it had worked perfectly. Kuro responded by calling Sora ridiculous and asking if she was aware of it. Sora replied that she hears that often. As Sora helped her walk by acting as her leg, Kuro loudly declared that she wouldn't lose next time. The audience remarked on the thrilling duel, which gave them chills. One inquired about the skill or technique Sora used at the end, while another wondered how Sora managed to defend against Kuro's rear attack with a similar sword. Another spectator responded, admitting that it was something he could never accomplish. Hearing their ongoing discussions, Kuro looked down, vowing to win next time. Noticing this, Sora called out to Kuro, suggesting that she should carry Kuro, who was still weak from the duel, in her arms like a groom carrying his bride. This made Kuro blush and mumble something inaudible. Sora thought to herself that she didn't really have the strength for such an act, and that it seemed like she wouldn't be rescuing anyone by carrying them away from the battlefield. Then Kairi approached Sora, offering to help carry Kuro. Kuro responded that she would prefer to be carried by Sora, prompting Kiri to comment on her straightforwardness. Consequently, Kiri ended up carrying Kuro. Sora then asked Kuro what she would have requested if she had won the duel. After a moment of hesitation, Kuro finally said that she would have asked to be Sora's friend. Sora asked if that was all she would have requested, and Kuro confirmed, explaining that she didn't have any friends her age and thought they could be friends. Sora responded that Kuro didn't need to win a duel to ask that, which surprised Kuro. At that moment, Kiri suddenly let go of Kuro. Kuro landed on her feet, staggered, and was about to fall, but Sora caught her in time, saying she already considered Kuro a friend. Kuro then asked if Sora would be her friend, to which Sora responded affirmatively with a smile. They held hands, declaring their friendship. Sora told Kuro that she would send her a friend request, which Kuro could accept once she recovered. The rest of the spectators then rushed towards Sora, asking to be her friends too. However, some men stopped them, calling them idiots and threatening to kill them if they interfered with the girl's interaction. The spectators backed off, and a confused Sora asked what just happened. Kiri explained that the men who stopped the spectators were members of a state-run religious group known as LMD, which had the authority to apprehend anyone who interfered with interactions between women, a rule established by NPCs. Suddenly, a voice echoed from behind them. It's been a while, Sora, it said, noting that Sora's fight had shown no signs of training neglect. Turning around, they saw Shigure, the mentor of both girls. Kuro rushed to Shigure, wrapping her in a big embrace and shouting her name. She expressed her surprise, thinking Shigure was busy leading a team of professional gamers overseas in America. 
Shigur returned the hug, patting Kuro on the head and apologizing for guard's disturbance to Sora. She promised to apologize to Shin and Ro later as well. Shigur then addressed Kiri, asking if she could use her store. She explained that she hadn't seen Sora in five years and would like a place to talk with her. She also expressed her desire to talk with Kiri. Kiri agreed without hesitation, noting that Kuro seemed to be asleep. She decided to lay Kuro to sleep in the back room, expressing her wish to spend more time with them. She then hung a closed sign in front of her store to prevent customers from coming in, assuring Shigur that they wouldn't be disturbed. Shigur thanked her for this. Sora, surprised, asked if Shigur and Kairi already knew each other. Shigur confirmed this, revealing that they were in the same club in college and that Kiri was one of the few people who could match her. Kiri jokingly questioned if she heard Shigur correctly, as she couldn't recall ever beating Shigur. Shigur then thanked Sora for getting along with Kuro. She explained that Kuro was the child of a relative of her band, a first-year middle school student whose situation had become complicated. She had been without parents since the previous year. Since Kuro had no other relatives, Shigur had taken her in. Sora, shocked, asked if Shigure was sure she could raise Kuro. Shigure admitted that Sora was right, as Kuro had become a bit reclusive since moving in. She didn't know how to handle it, so she had encouraged Kuro to play games with her. Sora expressed her understanding of the situation. Shigure then asked Sora if she thought Kuro was strong. Sora energetically agreed, saying Kuro was very strong. Shigure, smiling and pointing to the sky, revealed to Sora that Kuro had only started playing six months ago. Sora couldn't believe it, asking if Kuro had reached her level in just half a year. Shigur informed Sora that, as Kuro is a novice, it is Sora's responsibility to guide her in proper online gaming behavior. He pointed out that Kuro's habit of drawing her weapon frightened the other players. Shigur added that anyone would be wary if they witnessed Kuro unsheathing her weapon, making surprise attacks difficult, and questioned Sora's agreement. Sora conceded that it would indeed make her cautious. As the conversation progressed, Sora internally questioned why Shigur, usually so strict about online etiquette, seemed lenient with Kuro. Could it be because Kuro is a relative? Shigur then abruptly shifted the topic to Sora's unexpected transformation, recalling Sora as male. Kiri, taken aback, pressed for an explanation. Sora, embarrassed, shared that upon losing a battle to the Demon King at the game's start, she was cursed and transformed into a girl. The curse, she explained, could only be lifted by defeating the Demon King. Kiri, seeking clarification, asked if Sora was truly a boy, to which Shigur confirmed, citing her lifelong knowledge of Sora. Shigur speculated that if Sora's situation were a bug, it would have been swiftly resolved by the game's developers, suggesting instead that it might be a special event. Observing Sora's demeanor, Shigur sensed there was more to the story than a mere avatar gender swap. She pressed Sora, confident that her familiarity with him made his attempts to conceal the truth futile. Sora, unnerved by Shigure's perceptiveness, eventually relented, revealing a secret. The curse had granted her a unique skill. Upon using destiny points, she gained the title Kusai and seven superior skills. Both Shigur and Kiri reacted with intrigue, eager to learn more about this unexpected development. She revealed the tab on her interface, indicating that using one destiny point would transform her into Kusai, granting benefits such as reduced physical and magical damage, enhanced status ailments, lower MP usage, information display, enemy detection within 20 meters, and a quadrupled rate of earning job points. Kairi noted the significant advantage of the fourfold job point increase, explaining that at level 20, a player would accumulate 76 job points, enough to maximize a single skill. She mused that it seemed like a deliberate design to make Sora the strongest player. Sora admitted her lack of connections with the game's management and her curiosity about the true meaning of becoming Kusai. Kiri, with a hand on her chin, excitedly speculated whether Sora might sprout wings like the fallen angel Lucifer upon becoming Kosai. Sora, amused, confessed she hadn't attempted it, preferring not to squander her remaining destiny points frivolously. Shigur, adopting a serious tone and touching her lip in contemplation, voiced her approval of Sora's prudent decision to conserve her destiny points. She offered her interpretation of the situation as mere conjecture, suggesting that the number 100 of remaining destiny points might symbolize a human's lifespan. This analogy struck Sora with a sense of dread, visibly sweating and opening her mouth in astonishment. Sora inquired if Shigur had just suggested that destiny points could symbolize a person's remaining lifespan. Shigur confirmed this, 
adding that there's a chance that once the remaining destiny reaches zero, the avatar they're using might vanish. She clarified that this was merely her speculation. Cryy interjected, noting that the game only permits a user to create a single account. If Shigor's theory holds, a player who exhausts their destiny would be permanently barred from Astral Online. Shigur, deep in thought, voiced that given the substantial amount of destiny points each user starts with, she could envision this scenario. Sora responded, pointing out that no player has depleted their destiny points yet, so the outcome remains uncertain. Shigure's words lingered in Sora's mind, leading her to ponder the implications. She wondered if, like his gender change, destiny could impact the real world. What if a player's real life ends when their destiny points reach zero? Seeing Sora's troubled expression, Shigur asked what was wrong. Cry answered for Sora, chiding Shigur for her seriousness and obliviousness to Sora's fear. Shigur apologized, admitting she hadn't intended to frighten Sora and had forgotten Sora's aversion to horror stories. Cryi teased Sora, expressing surprise that the silver support mage had such a weakness. Shigur then changed the subject, announcing her upcoming return to Japan for work, accompanied by Kuro. Sora questioned Shigur's sincerity about her return, which Shigur affirmed. Sora decided to wait and see. Awakening in a cold sweat, Sora lay on her bed like a log, murmuring to herself. She couldn't revert to being a man unless she defeated the Demon King. She also feared that if her destiny points hit zero in the process, she might die in real life. She reminded herself that the game had only just begun. She considered playing it safe, quitting the game and remaining a woman until someone else defeated the Demon King. If Shiori or her friends were in her situation, she was certain she would advise them to do the same. She acknowledged that the game could last for many months or even years, with a determined expression, she resolved to continue playing Astral Online to the end, refusing to flee. Drawing confidence from her past victories over countless games, both good and bad, she understood that the game wasn't impossible to clear. She knew she would be ashamed to run from such a direct challenge. She then decided to gather more information about the game. She left her room and saw her sister Shiori cooking. Shiori addressed Sora as her older sibling and mentioned that she was perspiring. She also informed Sora that she wouldn't be served dinner unless she bathed. Sora agreed to this condition. Shiori added that from now on, she would be the one assisting Sora with her daily baths. Sora expressed some discomfort with this arrangement, but Shiori insisted, assuring her that all she needed to do was to remain quiet. Shiori then led Sora to the bathroom and helped her change into her bathrobe, which made Sora feel a bit uneasy. Shiori then proceeded to help Sora clean up, ensuring that she was thoroughly washed from head to toe. After the bath, as Shiori was combing Sora's hair, Sora mentioned that she couldn't remember what happened after the bath. Shiori jokingly called her forgetful and warned her not to try to remember too hard or she might have to help her forget again. After combing Sora's hair, Shiori handed her a piece of clothing to wear. Sora found the clothing unfamiliar and asked Shiori about it. Shiori explained that it was a sports bra, which should have been obvious to her. Shiori then complimented Sora on her appearance and helped her get dressed. After dressing up, Shiori led Sora by the hand as they walked past a mirror. Sora looked at her reflection and commented that she looked too beautiful. Shiori agreed, expressing that she disliked the thought just as much as Sora did. They then went to the table to have dinner. Sora thanked her younger sister for the meal before she started eating. While Sora was eating, Shiori mentioned that Shigur had told her about everything and that it seemed like Sora had caused quite a stir. Sora was upset to hear this, and questioned whether Shigur really needed to tell her younger sister everything. Shiori explained to Sora that people were really surprised, especially about her strength and acceleration skills, saying that they didn't seem like the normal version. Sora acknowledged her understanding. Shiori then drew Sora's attention to the online comments. Many users were commenting on Sora's rare skill level, which made Sora feel proud. Shiori noticed that the praises were really getting to Sora, and playfully chided her not to let it go to her head. Shiori turned to her older brother, Sora, and reassured him that he was free to make his own choices, but she also asked him not to worry her too much. Sora agreed with Shiori's point and expressed a sudden desire to share something with her. He pleaded with Shiori to stop playing the game. Shiori, looking at Sora, asked if his request was related to his conversation with Shigure. Sora confirmed it was, explaining that his gender change was proof that the game could affect real life. He warned that if someone ran out of destiny points in the game, they could potentially die in real life. This revelation frightened Shiori, 
who asked Sora in a panicked voice if he would also stop playing the game. Sora apologized to Shiori, but insisted that he would continue playing. He explained that Shin and Ro would keep playing without knowing anything, and he couldn't abandon Kuro, Kiri, and Shiguri. Sora admitted that his decision was incredibly selfish, but before he could finish his sentence, Shiori interrupted him. Shiori declared that she would fight too, reminding Sora that she was also a disciple of the strongest pro gamer, Shiguri. Sora, knowing his sister well, understood that once Shiori made up her mind, she wouldn't back down. He hugged Shiori, advising her not to overdo it and to run away if she felt something was dangerous. Shiori reciprocated the sentiment, telling Sora to be careful as well. Suddenly, a notification from Astral Online popped up on their phones, announcing an event. Shiori received messages about a meeting with her clan before the event. Sora remembered that his younger sister was a member of one of the top-ranking clans. As Shiori prepared to leave for the meeting, she reassured Sora that she knew it was hard for him, but he needed to hang in there in his false body. Sora agreed and said he would log back in as well. With their minds made up, the two siblings logged back into the Astral Online game.